Good morning, folks. I'd like to say that he is alive and well this morning. Aren't you glad you're a Christian this morning? Aren't you glad you're not as those that have no hope? But we have a, a steadfast hope forever and ever we can be with him. What a, what a wonderful day to celebrate. Right now we've got some kids that's going to sing us a little song. So, Miss Rita, if you'll come right on up. That's the blue microphone, by the way, uh, Randy. <clears throat> Let's all stand and sing, he's alive. Let's, let's sing it this morning, all right? Please come.
This is plum exciting this morning. We get to sing about our resurrected Lord. What a wonderful day this is going to be. Let's all turn. Well, it'll be on the screen. It'll be page 220 if you'd like to follow along. But we need to sing about He is alive. Let's all stand together and sing our first song. He lives. so much you may be seated Amen. singing singing making melody in their hearts because he lives he's alive he came suffered blood and died for you and i but thank god he arose ascended he's coming back for us and we're worshiping him today to all the visitors we're so happy and delighted you're here with us this morning thank god for his blessings his abundant mercy he has been good to us he's, uh, he, he shines his light and leads us. We had a wonderful sunrise service this morning. Breakfast afterward. Thank for all those people that prepared the wonderful food for Brother Gunn, who preached the word to us this morning. We sang songs, enjoyed it, and here we are again, just lifting up the name of Jesus, worshiping him, adoring him. Brother Tim Israel is going to come pray with us in force, and while he's coming, I'll read a thank you card. Good to have a Brother Bud and Miss uh, Willisa Bagwell with us this morning. They've been in Florida, went down there, and three days later, this is several weeks ago, uh, had to go to the hospital, 14 days in the hospital recovery, but they're back now. We want to thank all of you for the prayers 
for praying for me during my illness. We love our church family, and we sure feel the prayers so much. When I was away at my lowest, may God forever bless everyone. Love you, uh, the Willises. The Bagwells, we appreciate them and being able to be back with us. Got a lot to be thankful for. If you're a visitor this morning, would you put that visitor card that you'll find a, behind the back of the pew? Put it in the offering plate after a while, and we're sure we'll thank you for doing that. Yeah, you know, um, before we started, we you know we had a breakfast this morning, and uh, I was able to help cook a little bit, so I drank a little more caffeine than probably I should, so I'm liable to be talking for about an hour if that's okay with you. But uh, not there's, uh, you know, this is a special time, and uh, you know, to me, I like this better than I do Christmas because uh, this is today we celebrate when he came out of the tomb, and that's what made it real for us to have eternal life. And uh, I've got something, I've had this in my Bible, I've got it at my desk at work, and I've got it hanging on my wall. If you don't have a mind, I'd like to read this to you. It's always been special to me. And I, I want to let you know, I struggle, and I'm sure y'all do. Everybody's got their own things that are wrong, sicknesses, and we're dealing with that with our son. And y'all are having the same things. And uh, you know, in the end, it's going to be okay. Sure. But as a, and I've said this every time I get up here, I struggle. So y'all pray for me. My wife is so faithful, but she struggles too. And sometimes I feel I'm not there to back her because I'm a man. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm stubborn. And everybody knows me well enough to know that, but that's the way I'm geared. I took just like my mom and my daddy. So if y'all got a minute, if you don't care, I won't keep you more than an hour. Uh, and uh, I know Roy, Roy, you preached, what, 20, 30 minutes. So is that okay with you about two o'clock? Uh, we were able to go to a Good Friday service. I've never been to one. We went to uh, a Good Friday service, and I tell you, that was really good because, you know, that is when, uh, you know, uh, they crucified him. So, you know, this, this all comes, and I urge you, you know, it, it, one thing about it the other night, I'm getting wound up. I told you, I told you, Randy. They were so many young babies at that church. Our granddaughter was able to go, and my son was able to go, and I just looked through that, and all them little young are just hollering, and I said, man, this is pretty neat, ain't it? And, you know, I thought, what are they going to see as they get older? And I say this every time. I look at a lot of you older people, and I'm getting on up there, too, that I've known a long time. And I appreciate how you raised us kids. I appreciate my mom and dad. I appreciate my heritage. And I'm thankful they brought me up, even though I might have strayed a time or two through my life, but I knew I was wrong. But I hope I got things right. And there's only a way to get it right, and that's through our Savior. So if you don't bear with me just a minute, let me read you this, if I can get through it, okay? It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate is struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know what Sunday's are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday seeing Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world is winning. People are sinning and evil is grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross, and then they raise him up next to the criminals. But it's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved, but they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. 
It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death is won. Sin is conquered, and Satan is just laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It's only Friday. But guess what's coming Sunday? And I just, that just, that just got to me, and that's when he was raised from the dead and made it so we could have salvation. Yes. So, like I say, I'm not perfect. None of us are. I'm praying for your families. We know what you're going through. Continue to pray for us. And I appreciate Roy and his family. Let's pray for Sandra. But, you know, I look at this, when I look at this at my desk, and, and I've said this, I deal, I'm still working, I still deal with a lot of things I never thought I'd see. And I always look, it always sticks, when I walk out, I, I see that hanging on my wall, and I say, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. So that day is almost here, and we need to be ready. Yeah. So I appreciate y'all's prayers. I love y'all so much. I love this church. Uh, and uh, let's just pray, and we'll get on with the singing. Father, we thank you for this day, Father, for this glorious time of the year that we come to to celebrate your, Father, where you loved us, that you died on the cross for us, and then you rose the third day, Father, that we'd have salvation. Father, we thank you for each one here today. Father, we just ask you to touch our nation. Father, it is so lost right now. We ask you to just touch it, save it, give us revival. Thank you for the good days growing up and the heritages that we all had. Father, I pray that you'll be with the pastor today as he preaches. If somebody's lost, still get saved, Father. It's all that matters. Lord, you know the needs of our lives. We thank you for everyone. And Lord, just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you.
would like to say one thing. I woke up this morning thinking about this, but Colossians, or 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. May we never get over the cross. Listen as we sing, the old rugged cross made the difference. You know, in Hebrews 9, 12, it says, Christ entered once into the Holy of Holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He entered one time. The sacrifice of animals at that time was over with. It was done with. His blood was, a, was a, uh, sufficient for all people, all mankind, for all time. Romans 5, 9 says, We have been justified. We have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Listen as we sing this song, The Blood of Jesus. Before we sing, Brother Randy asked me to sing this song, sing a verse of this song. And I had never sung this song before. I had heard it, but I hadn't sung it. But 
As I listened to it and I learned it, the Collinsworth family uh, did this. She wrote it, actually. And I got to listening to the words, and I just got overwhelmed with the thought that if it hadn't been for the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary's cross, if it hadn't been for the empty tomb that we celebrate today, you know, folks, we'd have no hope. But there's good news. We got hope. Great message this morning, Brother Gunn. We need to go and tell the good news of the hope of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful song, it's, and Randy already introduced, entitled The Blood of Jesus. Trust it will be a blessing to you. Hey. 
get that on the screen or not miss miss heather page number one it's a notebook what a meeting
one another just feel right at home and in God's house as the choir comes in.
Bible says he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. We have Jim and Sharon Cooper going to come and sing our special this morning if they would come at this time. <clears throat> Thank you for that beautiful song and for every song for Touch of God on the service this morning. We do things a little bit different today. It's Chief Sunday. The fifth Sunday doesn't come very often on Easter, but it did this year. And our youths will be taking up the uh, offering this time as Miss Sharon will keep playing. And we appreciate you being here this morning. And God's here with us this morning, taking care of all their needs. And the song said, at the right time, he came, he came to die. And at the right time, he will come to your heart and my heart to convict us of sins. And that is the time you need to respond. So now I'll, I'll pick my time to respond when he calls. No, you won't. Not and be successful, you won't. When he knocks on your heart's door and says, it's your time. Then you listen and come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 
so thankful for this opportunity to call on your high and holy name. Thank you, Father, that you left splendors of heaven and came down this old wicked world to die for our sins, to shed your blood that we may be redeemed. And I thank you, Father, that we can worship and adore you and lift up your name. And those that are in sin and have never confessed that sin to you and acknowledge and ask you to forgive them, what a wonderful opportunity it would be today, your time. We thank you for those that can give and for those that cannot give. For the visitors we have with us this morning, for everything, Father, this pleasing to you, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. And after this offering, Brother Guns will come and preach to us, listen attentively as we worship the Lord together. Take our Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter number 24. Psalms chapter number 24. Brother Jason, if it's all right, uh, if you and the youth choir, after the message, um, if you don't mind, come and sing uh, The Last Blood. Uh, Youth, if you'll just be ready to come on up after the message, come up. Quietly, respectfully, be ready to sing the last blood. I think that'd be fitting this morning. Do you smell that aroma this morning? That fragrance that's permeating the sanctuary? It may just be me so close to these lilies, but I smell another aroma. The lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon is oh so near. And how can we smell, how can we sense the presence of this lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon if he wasn't alive and risen from the dead? We serve a risen Savior. I bless his name this morning. Psalms chapter number 24. Psalms chapter number 24 this morning at the sunrise service. Uh, We looked and we focused on a a simple message, a command, a mandate that the followers of Jesus Christ were to go and tell 
Tell the simple story that Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has been buried, but thank God, praise his name, Jesus Christ is risen. And we walked through the New Testament and saw where the followers and Paul, the disciples, were faithful in telling that message all through the New Testament. But this morning, we'll look at the resurrection from a different angle, from a different point of view, from a different light. And it's found in Psalms chapter 24. We know Psalms chapter 24. It's a Psalm of David. It's a song. It is a uh, act of worship from King David. And several years ago, I preached a message out of Psalms 24 on the, uh, com- uh, concerning the compassion of a king. This morning we serve a compassionate king. We serve one that's compassionate enough to lay down his life for me and for you. One that's compassionate enough to to be a substitutionary sacrifice for me and for you. Compassionate enough to die on an old rugged cross. Compassionate enough uh, to, to raise again in the newness of life for me and for you. His compassion this morning I'll say is like none other. Uh, the Bible says for scarcely. For scarcely a righteous, for a righteous man, one will die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But listen to the compassion of this king. But God committed his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's compassion, my friend. That's why we're here this morning. Jesus' love and Jesus' compassion dying for us. Jesus' love and his compassion arose and arising from the dead, giving us hope and giving us victory. The compassion of a king. But this morning, I'm not so interested in this compassionate king. I want to look and I'm interested in the coming of a king. Before we read Psalms 24, I'd like to read a A a verse found in the Gospel of John. You don't have to turn for time's sake. You know the story. I pray you know the story. Mary, early in the morning, she's come to the tomb. She uh, goes and she's uh, the stone is rolled away. She's weeping outside the tomb. She stoops down. She looks in and she hears a voice. A voice that says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? In all of her distress, in all of Mary's heartache, in all of her sadness, she thinks it to be the gardener. But this voice, this one speaks to Mary again and he calls her by name. He says, Mary, her distress is now turned into relief. Her sadness is turned into joy. Her heartaches turned into jubilation. And in John chapter 20, verse 17, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto your Father, unto my Father and to your Father, and to my God and your God. Jesus died on the cross, laid in a tomb. Three days later, he he arises from the tomb and Mary sees the literal bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No doubt she's thrilled. She's excited. She wants to worship and hug him and fall at his feet. And he says, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. That brings us to Psalms chapter 24. Psalms chapter 24, it's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of ascension. A psalm about one that's ascending, that's going to go up. One that speaks of going back to the Father, going back to the throne, going back to a city, going back to heaven. It's a messianic psalm, a psalm that David is facing, but yet it points to and it directs and it focuses on the Messiah. King David in this psalm, in this song, he writes it from a true historical real life event. 
David like you and David like me, he, he would have good days and he would have bad days. He would have ups and downs. He would have days where he was on fire for God and days that he felt like God was nowhere around. David here is writing this psalm. He's writing this psalm because the ark of God is not where it's supposed to be. The ark of God should have been in Jerusalem. It should have been in the city of God. It should have been dwelling with God's people. The ark of God, God's presence, God's power is not where it's supposed to be. And we find that the ark of God is in a man's house by the name of Obed-Edom. A man, not in the city of Jerusalem, not in the city of God, not where the ark's supposed to be, but it's a man by the name of Obed-Edom's house. King David, David's mighty men, they go, they fight the enemy, they fight the the foe, they fight the uh, Philistians, and now they are bringing the ark back home. The presence of God. The power of God, God's blessing, God's uh, touch, the ark of God, the jubilation, the thrill, the excitement. They've defeated the enemy. They're bringing the ark of God back to its rightful place. The ark is coming home. But yet they were doing something, doing the right thing the wrong way. They're transporting God's presence They're moving and they are carrying the ark of God on a cart. A cart pulled by oxen. You see, we know from the word of God when uh, God is to be moved and transported, it was only to be done by the priests and the Levites. God's presence, God's power wasn't to be handled in just any old way. It was to be handled oh so careful. May I say this morning, the creator God, the Lord God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, he saved us, he's redeemed us, he's sealed us by the Holy Ghost, he's brought us and he's purchased us by his precious blood, and we ought to not offend. We should be careful not to grieve. We should be careful not to make sorrow the blessings and the power and the presence of God that he's bestowed upon us. They're carrying the ark back home. They're pulling it by a cart with oxen. The ark begins to shake. It begins to get unstable. It begins to, to teeter. And a man by the name of Uaz, he, he stops and he, he tries to shore up the ark and, and make sure it doesn't fall. It was precious. But they were doing the right thing the wrong way. God smites you as. God kills you as. And now David is upset. David is broken. David is heartbroken. He's, he's angry. You as is dead. We don't know a lot about you as. The Bible doesn't tell us much about this man. But his name means strength. He was a strong man. A powerful man. A mighty man. One that, that, that wanted to serve God with his power and his all his might. How often? How often by our own strength, by our own knowledge, by our own power, by our own intellect, we try to serve God. Never before, Pastor, have we had so many resources to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died and Jesus Christ arose again. Never before have we had so many avenues to to reach the lost. Never before have we had so much knowledge at our fingertips and the ease of spreading the good news that Jesus saves, how he died, how he is buried, and how he rose again. But unlike before, we are lacking the power of God. Absent, absent from our lives absent from our families, absent from our churches, absent from this country. This man was trying to do that which was right by his own strength, by his own power, by his own 
will. You as his motive was right. He wanted to hold and make sure that ark didn't fall. His motive was right. His decision was, was honorable. But now he's dead. David's upset. David's angry. David's heartbroken. So he brings the ark of God, the power, the presence of God, and he places it in Oded Edom's home. It rests there for three months. For three months. It's in Obed Bedem's home, and David catches wind. He hears how Obed Edom is being blessed. The Bible says he was blessed in all things pertaining him, all because he had the power and the presence of God with him. David heard. This excited David. He was thrilled. He knows that God has not changed. He knows that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He knows that if we have the presence and the power of God, this ark with us will be blessed. Let me say this morning, church, the day I got saved, the day I got born again, the day I got redeemed and snatched from the pits of hell, Jesus has blessed my life. If if we have the power and the presence of God, will be blessed. Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. So David went, brought the ark of God back from the house of Oded-Edom into the city of David with gladness. That brings us to Psalms 24. The ark, the presence of God, the power of God is coming home. Rather, let me say this morning, someone is coming home. Second Chronicles 15, verse 16 says, And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint the brethren of the to appoint their brethren to be singers with instruments of music, psalteries, and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up their voice with joy. The ark's coming home. The ark's coming back to Jerusalem. The ark's coming back to the city of God. They're playing instruments. They're singing. They're rejoicing. They're, they're, they're thrill. They're, they're, they're happy. The jubilation. They're singing. Oh, preacher, what are they singing? Psalms 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. That's what they were singing. That's what they were rejoicing and shouting about. But on this day, This day that we're celebrating, Resurrection morning, Resurrection Sunday. There's another king that went home. You see, the ark of God for three months had been in Obed Bedem's house. But Jesus Christ, he had been absent from his father. Absent from the city. Absent from that angelic choir for 33 years. The Son is about to come home. The crucified, the buried, the resurrected Son is coming home. Preaching on the thought this morning, the Son is coming home. As He approaches glory, the voices ring out. The angelic choir begins to sing. Lift up your heads, verse 7, O ye gates. And be ye lift up, everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. I'll see number one. There was a grand entrance. 
a great and grand entrance. They tell me as a king would go off into battle, as they would go off and the slay the enemy, as they would enter the city coming back home, the inhabitants of the city would begin to offer praise and, and, and salutations and rejoice. They would cast their affections on this king. They would honor this conquering king. They would praise this conquering king. And here we see another victorious king, one that was victor in the battle, one that was uh, a victor over the greatest enemy we face, which is death. You see, he's making a grand entrance. But he made another grand entrance some three days later. There on the cross, my Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered and died and bled and paid my penalty of my sin. They laid him in the tomb. Matthew tells us, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. He's dying on the cross, a substitutionary sacrifice for me and for you. His lifeless corpse is taken down and he enters the tomb. Locked in death he was. Held by the grave he was. Grasped by the darkness of death. And he's covered in the stillness and the silence of death. But three days later, three glorious days later, something began to happen there at Joseph's tomb. Early in the morning, the earth begins to shake. The the tremble. We see the rose of Sharon is blooming. Come and smell the fragrance. Jesus got up from the grave and he's alive forevermore with great power. Oh, so power. Jesus arose from the dead. Speaking of his death, Jesus said, no man take it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Good news, church. Good news this morning. We serve a living God. It's not a myth. It's not a fable. It's not wishful thinking. Jesus Christ is alive evermore. We're talking about this victorious king. He tells Mary, touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my father. He's ascending to the city. These gates are to be thrown open. He's to be given a mission the one that's worthy, the one that's, that's high, the one that's lofty, the one that's victorious. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. A grand and glorious entrance to the city. You know, this morning, if you don't know this victorious King, He wants to come into your life. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to be your Savior. He wants to redeem you. Will you invite Him in? Will you welcome Him in? Will you open the doors and the gates of your heart and welcome this victorious King? Here comes the Son. It's a grand and glorious entry. They're singing, they're praising. Here He comes, a grand entrance. But I see there's also a great inquiry. A great inquiry. These porters, the gatekeepers, the watchers are here in Jerusalem. They're told, they're commanded to lift the doors, to open the gates. And they inquire. They ask a question. They inquire of this king. Verse number 8, who is this king of glory? Who is this coming king? Who is this Uh, uh, one that's victorious in battle. What is his name? What's his character? What's his nature? Well, I'm glad they ask. His name's Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my friend. He's my Redeemer. He's my Comforter. He's my God. He's my Lord. He is Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. Many today still ask who this king is. In Mark, they ask him, is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary? 
Some said he was a just a man. Some said that he was a good teacher. He was a rabbi. Some said he was just a prophet. Some said he was Elias. Some said he was John the Baptist. Who is he? Who is this king of glory? The porters, the gatekeepers, the watchers had a great inquiry. I'll tell you who he is. He's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he's coming home. Who is the King of glory? Verse 8 tells us, who is this King of glory? The Lord. That's the, the word Jehovah, the existing one, the eternal one, the everlasting one, the King of glory. Who is this King of glory? Jesus is his name. Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ the Lord. He's strong, the Bible tells us. It's the word to be powerful. To be strong and mighty. But it also comes from a Hebrew word that means to prevail. To win in battle. You mean to tell me this morning that this king, this strong, this powerful, this mighty king has prevailed in battle? He tells us the Lord's strong and mighty and the Lord mighty in battle. They ask the question, a great inquiry, who is this king? Who is the strong one? Who is this powerful one? Who is the one that prevailed in battle, defeated our foe, defeated death, rose victorious? Who is he? John the Revelator tells us who he is. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 14, John's on the Isle of Patmos. He sees this victorious king. And John said his head and his hairs were white like oil. His, and, and white as snow, his eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burnt in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I felt at his feet dead, and laid at his feet, and laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. Amen. Who is he? He's the champion. Who is he? He's the victor. Who is he? He's the Lord, strong and mighty, my Savior, my Redeemer, my God. A grand entrance. There was a great inquiry. But I also see his glory is eternal. Verse number 9, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. You know, verse 9 and verse 10, it's a repeat of verse 7 and verse number 8. And in this psalm, in this song, They tell me that that's a refrain, a chorus, a chorus of a song that usually tells us what the song is about, that that, that points to the purpose of the song, that, that, that tells us the meaning of the song. He's the coming king. He's the everlasting king. He's the eternal king. He's the endless king of all glory. In verse 10, he said, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Who is this one? The God of all glory. The Savior. The Redeemer. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of battle. The Lord of victory. And this morning, as we acknowledge, as we hail and as we cast our salutations and our praise and our worship to this King for His glory, for His eternal, for His everlasting, for His endless glory. We see Him as He's walking, as He's coming into the city. You know, they tell me, Pastor, that no doubt we know David, the city, those inhabitants, sang Psalms 24. 
as the power, the presence, the ark of God is coming back into the city. No doubt, I believe with all my heart, this psalm, somehow, some way, in the city of God, was sung when the sun was coming home. Those writers, theologians, commentators, they tell me that this song will be sung once again as Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem. He's going to set up his kingdom, the millennial reign. They will be singing, they will be shouting Psalms 24, verses 7 through 10. A grand entrance. A great inquiry. But his glory is forever. But I'll submit to you this morning. He didn't come back to the city empty-handed. He left, but he's bringing something back with him. They tell me when these kings, these victorious kings would go off into battle, they would defeat the enemy, they would defeat the foe, they would always bring something back. Whether it was the prisoners of the defeated army, whether it was the head or the body of the losing king, they would always bring something back as a trophy. This king is no different. He's bringing something back. The son's coming home, and he has something else. You say, what is it, preacher? You don't have to turn, I'll read it to you. Hebrews chapter 9. Brother Randy's already quoted it. Verse number 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves. Here it is. But by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, obtaining eternal redemption for us. He's coming back. The son's coming home. And he's bringing his precious, sweet, royal, rich, redeeming blood with him. Brother Jason, if you'll come. Young people, if you'll make your way up. As they sing this song, picture, remember, focus on this son, this king that's coming back home. He's coming back home. With something to offer. Maybe you're here this morning. You don't know this king. You've never opened the doors, the gates of your heart. This altar's open. Why don't you come and call upon him? Why don't you come and seek his face? Is he speaking to you this morning? Maybe you're here this morning saved and born again and redeemed. Maybe you just want to come and thank this King of glory for dying on the cross, for being buried and raising again for you and for me. Listen to the words as they sing. The Son is coming home.
Amen. Thank the Lord for the wonderful service today. You came in great numbers today. Thank you for coming to worship the Lord and, and, and to be thankful for His re resurrection. But He's still alive. We heard that many times today. So if He's still alive, which He is, what next Sunday be a good thing just to come back? Same place, same people, same pews. Just sit where you are and so we can just keep worshiping the Lord our God. Because he is soon coming back. There's a lot of people you and I know that aren't saved, aren't redeemed. We get really close to God like he wants us to. When we're around them, they can see Christ in us. And they're the one salvation for themselves. Please do that. Services will be canceled tonight. And we will uh, just, many of you got family to go to, things to do. Next Sunday morning, the Lord's on the throne, and we're His people, and we sure need Him. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful that we can call you, Lord, and lift up your name. Thank you for the anointing on the service today, for Brother Gunn, for the preached word that we've heard. Thank you for the songs. Most of all, we thank you for the Spirit of God that's been with us and witness to us and we thank you God that we've been able to worship maybe some here father that have not been able to worship because they've never done what you told them to do they may be saved and they haven't followed you there may be some here this morning that's never surrendered heart to you and been saved you know all things we're trusting you we're looking to you we're trusting none other but thank you father for what you've done what you are doing we bless and praise your holy name with thanksgiving amen thank you so much for coming god bless you